morning, Wooddell Church. You know, this past week, I was uh, thinking about our time together this morning and the importance that corporate worship should hold in our lives. And I was reminded several times how blessed we are. We are a blessed people because we know Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior, and he is the recipient of whom we come to worship. But along with that blessing, I feel, comes a responsibility. And that responsibility means that when we come into worship on a Sunday morning as a group of people who have said, we love the Lord and he is first in our lives, that we make every intention of setting aside anything that would keep us from worshiping him. I think uh, a group of, of people like ourselves, a body of believers, one of, if not the most important thing we can do is to make sure that our corporate worship is fresh and alive and a priority in our lives. And so it is so good to see you here this morning and that we have made this a priority. And my prayer for all of us today is that we would be able to set aside anything that would keep us from completely and totally, without hesitation, approach the throne of God and give him our hearts, our souls, our very beings in worship. We stand on a firm foundation, which is the word of God, when we come together to worship. And so I would like to open our service this morning by reading from the seventh chapter of Matthew. And I'm going to ask, out of reverence and respect for God's word, that you stand with me. And hear these words that remind us on the importance of making sure we stand on the firm foundation, not only in our worship, but in our everyday life. And this firm foundation is the word of God. Starting at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. May our worship this morning be firmly planted on the solid rock, which is our Lord and Savior. Let's worship together.
gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you and praise you for the blessings that you give to us each and every day. And one of those great blessings is this opportunity to come together as a group of people who love you, to worship you, and to praise you, to make you the very center of our attentions and our affections. Father, we pray that our worship would be honoring to you, that it would be true and pure, that we would be all in this morning, that nothing would interfere with what we are here to do, and that is to worship you, to praise you, and to thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. Father, may we stand firmly on that solid rock as we worship you in spirit and in truth. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Wooddale Church. If we've not had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here at our Eden Prairie campus, and uh, I'm just so thrilled that you have chosen to worship God with us here this morning. Uh, one of the things that we do at Wooddale Church is we love to know that you were here, and so for those of you that are here at our Eden Prairie campus, uh, we have in the pew back in front of you a connection card. It looks just like this, and for those of you online, we have a digital version as well. Good to have you joining us as, uh, as well this morning, uh, and we do ask everyone to fill this out. I've set a good example. I've already completed this for me and Stephanie, and we'll, we'll put this in the offering plate uh, here this morning. We would invite you to do the same. Now, if you're a guest with us, this is your first time here at Wooddale Church, welcome. Welcome. We are grateful that you're here, and uh, we would love for you to fill out one of these connection cards as well. But in addition, as soon as our service is over, we have a team of people that are out in our common space by the next step area, and they would love a chance to get to know you and welcome you, let you know how you can become part of our church family here at Wooddale. Now, one of the reasons we ask you to fill out these connection cards is on the back, there is actually an opportunity for prayer. One of our values here at Wooddale Church is to be prayer reliant. It's one of the great privileges that being part of the church is we have the opportunity to pray for one another. So if there's something coming up in, in your week or something that's been a burden for you and you would love us at the church to be praying for you, uh, please put those prayer requests on the back and know and be confident that someone here at Wooddale Church will be praying for you specifically in the week ahead. This morning, we're wrapping up our series, Life at the Lake. Pastor Brian is going to be giving us just a wonderful message. And uh, next weekend, we're starting a brand new series. Uh, it's a series that will run for the month of August. I'm gonna be leading that series, and it's called Make the Most of It. And this, the idea of the series comes from uh, some reading that I was doing in the book of Ephesians several months ago. I came to chapter four of Ephesians, and I was just struck by the power and the beauty that Paul describes for us of the church. I thought this needs to be the series that we do in August. And so we're gonna be spending a lot of time in just those first few verses of Ephesians 4, understanding God's vision for the church and his invitation for us to be part of it. Here, here's what I'm convinced of. Each and every one of us will be inspired by this series to take another step into what God is inviting us to do and to be part of in terms of how he is building his church. And then at the end of that series, I'm excited because uh, we're gonna be joined by a guest. It's a friend of mine named Justin Brierly. Justin is uh, the author of a new book that comes out in September called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. How new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. Justin is based in the United Kingdom and he is a cultural apologist and has spent his entire career helping people to discover Jesus. And he has a wonderful and encouraging message for us about how we as the church can be prepared to engage for the cause of Christ, our post-Christian culture. And so I'm very excited for him to be joining us at the end of that series. More information on Justin's visit uh, as we kick off that series next weekend. We're gonna to continue to worship God now through the giving of our gifts and our offerings. So as we prepare our hearts to worship God this way, would you please join with me in prayer? Father, the invitation that you give to us to be part of your church, to come and to worship you, Father, is something that we should never take for granted. Father, thank you for this dedicated time and this dedicated space. Father, whether we're here in a building or we're watching online through a dedicated stream, Father, we have set aside this time to come and to hear from you. And Father, as part of our act of worship, Lord, we wanted to declare that we trust you and that we love you and that we know that you are good 
regardless of what's happening in our life. One of the ways we do that is by giving back to you what you've given to us through our gifts and our offerings. So Father, please be honored in how we now worship you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Life on the lake. You know, we Minnesotans love the lake. In Minnesota, we do everything we can to get to lakes. If we don't own cabins, we pray that we have friends 
who do and who are generous with their cabins. When it comes to boats like the one in front of me, we are uh, number one in the nation. Minnesotans, give it up for yourselves in ownership of boats per capita. There are 809,000 boats in the state of Minnesota, which means that one out of every six of you own a boat, all right, which is, which is pretty, pretty amazing in our state. We have a state that makes much of fishing. 36% of Minnesotans fish. And uh, so look around you, and, uh, and some of you actually catch fish in this state. In this state, with more than 10,000 lakes and 69,000 miles of rivers and streams, we support 91,000 jobs related to the fishing industry alone. $9.9 .9 billion of annual revenue for our state comes from fishing. And so we love to get in our lakes, whether it's fishing or snowmobiling or boating or cross-country skiing. Some of you even like to go ice fishing in the winter. I don't understand that one. Uh, and some of you love, like me, just getting to a cabin and spending a week by the lake. There's something about it that's in our blood, and it's one of the things I love about living in our state. And one of the things I love about our God is that our God is a relatable God. In fact, Jesus himself was someone who loved the lake. Pastor Dale preached last week, and he shared about this particular lake, Lake Genesaret, or something that place that we know as the Sea of Galilee, being a, a region that was really Jesus' hometown region in his ministry years. He loved spending time on the lake. And there are so many stories about Jesus that took place either on a lake, literally on a lake, or near a lake. And one of those stories is a story that we're going to look at today. And it comes from Luke's gospel. And as we've been doing, and we've already done once, I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time, and we're going to read God's word together. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. And it says this, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down in the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him out, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and suddenly the storm stopped, and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other, when he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him, you may be seated. And as you're seated, I want to ask you a question today, and it's simply this. How many of you know that sometimes the storms of life catch us unaware? You've been in that moment where you're going through life and maybe kind of walking through with blinders for a little while, and then out of nowhere, a crisis emerges my last year serving as the high school pastor at Wooddale Church back in 2007, one of those experiences happened in my life. I was with our Guatemalan ministry team in Central America. I was so excited because I had been there 17 times at that point and been really all over the, the world as a, as a youth pastor taking students around to different places. But my parents were getting ready to go on their first ever mission trip with my sister who was leading the trip to Istanbul, Turkey. And I remember uh, thinking, I ought to give my parents a call. And so in Antigua, Guatemala, I found a phone and I gave my parents a call knowing that they were leaving the next day. And I said, I'm so excited for you. We have just had a, a couple incredible weeks of ministry. I know that God has great things in store for you. I can't wait to hear all about it when you get back. And the trip started out easy enough. I mean, they got to Istanbul, they met with some missionaries, they were excited about what God was doing, but then my mom started to display some behavior that wasn't typical for her. She was saying some things that were a little bit strange, and then she started to have fainting spells, and my mom never had fainting spells. And then she had a fainting spell that resulted in her going into a coma, and they're in Istanbul, Turkey, first time out of the country for either one of them traveling. I remember my, my mom was rushed to the American hospital in Istanbul, and my dad and my sister were just scared to death. She wasn't coming out of the coma. The doctors were doing everything they knew to try to take care of her. They just didn't know what, what 
the solution was. They couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And to make matters worse, in Istanbul, a loved one could only spend 15 minutes a day by the side when somebody was in the ICU unit. So my dad was just beside himself, wanted to be with my mom. And then the doctor said, we don't think she's gonna make it. And so I got another phone call from my dad. I was the only one of my siblings with an active passport. I'd been back in the States for about 48 hours when my dad said, can you hop on a plane? I don't think mom's gonna make it. So I flew to Istanbul a few hours later, and long story short, what mom had was something called encephalitis. Some of you are familiar with that. It causes swelling of the brain. She survived, she is still alive today, but she's never been the same. It's been a challenge. In the years that would follow, my dad would break his neck. He was preparing to move them to their retirement home. He slipped on some ice, he broke his neck. It broke in such a way that the doctors at the University of Chicago said, we need to gather the family around. 75% of patients that have this break don't survive. And so I remember being at his bedside and praying with him before he went into surgery. The doctor said the, the chances of the surgery working are so slim, we've actually never had somebody walk again when they have this break. And dad not only survived the surgery, but within a month was walking again. And he's a walking miracle today. Many of you know the story of my sister who struggled with pregnancies, lost many babies along the way, and at 40, a couple years ago, became a mom for the first time. And through the surgery, through the, uh, through the pregnancy, she was experiencing some pain. And her friends kept telling her, Jenny, 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 it's just, you've never been pregnant that, that this long. That's what it feels like to be seven months pregnant and eight months pregnant. But when the back pain didn't go away, the day before her daughter's two-month checkup, she went into the hospital, to, to the doctor and said, can you just help me figure out what's going on with my back? They said, we're sure it's just, you're, you've just got some back pain from pregnancy, you're gonna be okay. They had her go in for an MRI and they came back ashen-faced. And her spine was just full of tumors. And they said, you have multiple myeloma that is metastasized into your back. And Jenny, we need to do surgery right away or you may never walk again. My sister was paralyzed for months. They said, Jenny, we don't know that you're gonna be here next year at this time. And my sister, who is an incredible writer, just journaled and wrote on blogs how she was feeling. And God, again, in his miraculous ways, has kept my sister here. The cancer is now in her mission, and the doctors say the mir a miracle has happened, but um, she continues to pray and continues to go through treatment. And then my father-in-law, like so many during the days of COVID, contracted COVID. And like so many other people in the world, he didn't recover. And I think about our family, and our family's not that unique. Every family has issues. Every family has storms that sometimes catch us unaware. And it could be that on this Sunday in July of 2023, you find yourself in the midst of one of those storms that has caught you unaware. Sometimes the storms of life do that. You know, that's where the disciples found themselves at the beginning of verse 22. What started as another extraordinary day with Jesus was going to turn in for them into somewhat of a nightmare. The verse begins innocently enough. enough. Look at 22 again. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the, of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. Now, getting onto a boat wasn't an unusual thing for Jesus or his disciples. His disciples were well accustomed to life at sea. At least four of his disciples were fishermen who had grown up in this region. They made their living on the sea. And when Jesus and the disciples got into the boat that day so they could cross to the other side of the lake, I'm sure the disciples just assumed this was just another trip with Jesus. Plus, this was the Sea of Galilee. This was their hometown. This was the lake that many of the disciples had grown up on. So many of the villages around the Sea of Galilee made their living on the lake. These were fishermen who were the sons of fishermen whose fathers before them were fishermen. Generations of fishermen in this area. If you've never been to the Sea of Galilee, you need to take a trip to the Sea of Galilee. Wooddale regularly takes trips to Israel. Get on one of those trips someday. It'll change your life. The Sea of Galilee, Dale said last week, is one of the most beautiful places he's ever visited in the world. The Sea of Galilee is located in, a, uh, in between the Arabian Desert and, um, 
is 686 feet below sea level. Uh, it is an area between the Arabian Desert and the Mediterranean Sea where these winds can just pick up and they can begin to whip. And, and because of the topography of that lake and everything else around it, the storms on that lake can be particularly scary. Many of you have seen the film The Perfect Storm. The ill-fated voyage of the Andrea Gale in one of the worst storms in history makes for a legendary and a sad tale. Sailors, even today, face storms at sea, but nowadays they can at least rely on radar. They can rely on the instruments in the boat to try to help them. The disciples' boat was nothing like that. The disciples' boat was a crude first-century fishing boat. In 1986, outside of the Sea of Galilee region, uh, an excavation uncovered this particular boat that is known as the Jesus boat, the Sea of Galilee boat. Now, Jesus probably didn't sail on this boat, but this is a boat that dates back to the first century that is like the boat that Jesus and his disciples would have been on. If you could see that in person, it's about 27 feet wide. It's about seven and a half, or long, seven and a half feet wide. And in its tallest spot, this boat would have been about four feet high, all right? So about this high, a little bit bigger than our, our boat here on stage today. So picture Jesus and his disciples getting into that. Now verse 23 continues the story. It says, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake and the boat was filling with water. Again, four feet high, filling with water. And I love how the Bible just kind of puts it right here. The disciples knew that they were in real danger. And some of you have been in real danger danger before. Some of you were in real danger this week. Jesus told Peter last week in the sermon to fish out in the deep. Remember Pastor Dale said fishermen didn't fish in the deep. They fished in the shallows. And once again, Jesus is taking his disciples into the deep. And, and again, as he does, Jesus just kind of settles down for a nap. And soon the storm came. The disciples were caught by surprise, and that's how it is sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes we're caught by surprise. We, we find out that our child gets sick, and this illness is a serious illness, and it just isn't supposed to be that way. Or the company that we work, work for that, that has been doing so well for the last several years is all of a sudden struggling, and we're facing downsizing. Or maybe the driver in the other lane is more consumed with their phone and texting than they are with driving. And they swerve, and there's injuries that are involved. The person that you love breaks your heart. Your best friend moves to another state. How do you react when you're going through the storm? I want to suggest to you today that most people generally react to life storms in one of three ways. They react with worry, they react with anxiety, or they react with fear. I wonder where my worriers are today. Any worriers in the room? Can we admit this? Can we have a big support group here at Wooddale Church today? If you ever struggle with worry, would you raise your hand? The rest of you are lying to me, all right? Everybody struggles with worry from time to time, all right? I mean, we do, and the liar support group's meeting next door, all right? So <laughs> it's hard. Life is hard sometimes. Last week, my wife and I decided to have a relaxing morning. We were going to celebrate our 32nd wedding anniversary. We had guests in from out of town this weekend, so we said, we'll go a weekend early. We went to Stillwater in the morning. It was beautiful. We enjoyed shopping. We enjoyed the, the, the sights. It was a glorious day. And then we decided to do something we've never done. We went to the Apple River, and we said, we're going to go tubing down the Apple River. <laughs> And all of you who are laughing know what the Apple River is like on the weekends. I'm just the ignorant pastor, all right? So we get on the Apple River, and we're going to go tubing. And we wake our way down the river, and again, it's a beautiful day last Friday, just gorgeous. And as we're going down the Apple River, and we're taking in the, the wildlife, literally the wildlife, and, and, uh, <laughs> and we're telling stories, and we're enjoying the birds, and the bees, and the flowers, and the trees, and, and everything else that we're seeing we noticed the unmistakable sound about an hour into our three-and-a-half-hour journey down the river of thunder. And I'm looking up in the sky, and I'm hearing thunder, and it just isn't, you know, matching. It was still blue, and, but this storm rolled in so fast. And pretty soon, the, 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 the joy that we were having on that trip came into a reality that we've got two hours left on this river. 
with our drunk friends all over the river. <laughs> now listen, we were a little worried. We felt a little anxious that day. But our challenge was nothing like the disciples faced that day. The disciples were in an all-out squall. The boat they were in was filling with water. Again, real danger is the way that Scripture defines what they were in. Experienced fishermen were in danger and they were worried. So let's talk about worry for a minute. Worry is an emotion that is based on an actual threat or danger. Okay, worry is faced is an emotion focused on an actual threat or danger that we face in our life. And we all face actual threats or danger to our lives. And some of you say, yeah, and I face them every day and every hour, and, and I really struggle with worry. There's an old song that says, into every life a little rain must fall. When the storms come into our life, it's natural to experience feelings of worry. Some of us know people, again, who worry a lot. Maybe that's you today. Again, if your company's downsizing, you may find yourself waking up at night because you're worried about whether you're going to have a job next week. When you receive a threatening diagnosis about your health, you're worrying about an actual threat, and you're wondering, what's that treatment plan going to look like? What is this going to mean for my family? What is this going to mean for my checkbook? Some of you woke up last night because you were worried about an actual threat or a danger to your life, and if that's you, I'm so sorry. It's a hard spot to be today, and I'm so proud of you for being in church today. Maybe you're worried about the state of your marriage. Maybe it's the actions of your children. Maybe it's your level of physical fitness or the bottom line of your checking account. If you worry the state that you find yourself, if worry is the state you find yourself in today, I want to tell you there is hope for you. There's hope. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Anxiety is a little different than worry. Anxiety is emotion, an emotion that is experienced in the face of a perceived threat or danger, all right? So worry, actual threat. Anxiety, perceived threat or danger. When we're dealing with anxiety, and I know there are many here who that is the state that you are in continually, you're dealing with a much more generalized fear. Those of you who struggle with anxiety, and I face this in my life, know that anxiety can be crippling, Anxiety can feel debilitating. When anxious, our fears don't always make sense. They're not always based in, in rational thought. We're scare, scared that we're going to do something that intellectually we know we would never do. I've talked with men and women who are scared that their partner is having an affair, not because their partner is cheating or has shown any evidence of that, but because their father had an affair or somebody they know at work did or they're watching the wrong television show and they're beginning to transfer that into others. Anxiety can cause us to lose sleep. It can cause us to put on weight, to impact our performance at work and sometimes spiral into all-out depression. Jesus' disciples on the lake that day were dealing with worry. They were dealing with a real danger, not a perceived threat, and their worry was quickly spiraling and doing all out panic, and maybe you've been there too. You know what it's like to feel the panic in life. When Cindy and I were on that river, we wanted off as soon as possible, as soon as we saw that first crack of lightning that was way too close, and thunder that was louder than any thunder I've heard in my life, I wanted off that lake. I said, God, I don't need another sermon illustration right now. I just need <laughs> off the lake. Listen, the disciples were worried because they knew that unless something changed, their lives could be over soon. Their boat was going to sink, and they were in the deep. At the beginning of verse 24, we see that the disciples went to the right place with their fear. And I want to say that again. The disciples went to the right place with their fear. And I want you to take an inventory for just a second. When faced with fear, what's the first place that you go to? Some would say, well, I go to my husband or wife. I mean, they're such a gift. I thank the Lord for that. Well, they are a gift, but they're not the greatest gift. And so look at the next verse. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. I mean, you can hear the panic in their voices. The disciples approached Jesus while he was sleeping, and I want to say that again. The disciples approached God while he was asleep. And that is an experience that you are never going to have. 
And if I was in my Southern Baptist background, I'd say, can I get an amen? I mean, (laughs) you are never going to have this experience because God is not asleep on the job. I love this picture of Jesus because it demonstrates his humanity and his divinity so perfectly. In his humanity, Jesus is exhausted. He has been teaching all day long. He's been dealing with disciples who sometimes were bickerers, all right? There are times when I wonder if Jesus had a little introvert in him because he loved to go and spend time alone with God. It is exhausting when you are continually pouring your life out into others. And in his humanity, Jesus was taking a nap. But in his divinity, he was completely in charge. Jesus was in charge of the situation. Look at how Mark's gospel, his parallel gospel, records the story. So they took Jesus into the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind. A little more information from Mark than we get from Luke, all right? There's some crowds he's leaving behind. And then he says, although other boats followed... But soon a fierce storm came up, high waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back and with his head on a cushion, so Jesus likes comfort. And then the disciples woke him out shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? The disciples, I believe, mistook the peace of Jesus with a lack of care. Jesus, don't you care? Ooh. Have you ever said that to God? God, don't you care? Don't you understand what it's like to be me? God, this is so hard. No, don't mistake the peace of your God with a lack of care. At least they were bright enough to know that they needed to go to Jesus when they were in over their heads. They certainly didn't know a way out of their predicament. And you've been there. I believe that just knowing that Jesus was in the boat brought the disciples a level of peace, but it also brought a level of irritation, like God is in the boat with us, and he's allowing us to go through this. Can't you just get us out of here? Why are we even in this spot in the first place? Do you ever question when you're in the storm? Do you ever struggle when you're in the storm? The disciples certainly did, and they were missing the point. See, storms, and many of us who've been through storms in our life know this, storms are often God's way of bringing us into a deeper walk with him. Can anybody attest to that today? Raise your hand if you can be a person who attests to that. See, we know that when we go through the hard times that God is still at work. He's not freaking out. He's not panicking. He's not full of anxiety and worry. God is in control. And he's working in us and through us. Sometimes this is what it takes to wake us from our spiritual slumber. How many of us can attest to the fact that our prayer life grows as well when we're facing the storms? Our dependency upon God is increased when the storms around us are raging. Paul Miller wrote a fabulous book years ago called The Praying Life. My daughter was a sophomore in college when he came to speak at their school in the Christian college in Ohio that she went to said this book is so fabulous we want all of our students to have it so the entire student body was purchased a copy of a praying life and when my daughter came home for Christmas that year she gave every one of her brothers a copy of that book and said guys this book has changed my life and so dad's like where's my copy so I went and bought a copy too And I gotta tell you, it's an amazing book about what prayer does in these situations. I wanna read one quote from Paul Miller in this book. He says, God takes everyone he loves through a desert. Call it a storm if you want for today's purposes. It is his cure for our wandering hearts, restlessly searching for a new Eden. In other words, we want what the world was originally created to be, but we can't experience that completely here on this side of eternity. Here's how it works. The first thing that happens is we slowly give up our fight. Our wills are broken by the reality of our circumstances. The things that brought us life gradually die, and our idols die for lack of food. So many of us go through storms in life because we put other things in the place that God needs to be, and our comfort at the lake, or our comfort in the job, or our comfort in the status quo is something that God sometimes needs to shake in us because that has been the source of our strength rather than the one who is our strength. When the disciples came to Jesus for help, you know what he does? He shows himself to be the Lord of creation. See, that's who was in the boat with them. The Lord of creation 
the one who spoke and worlds existed, the one who, who, who created the very lake that they were on is the one who was in the boat with them. When Jesus woke up, the end of verse 24 tells us, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm and that is such an understated Bible verse. Picture that. Jesus is asleep, the disciples are freaking out, he stands up and he speaks to the wind and the waves and all is calm. I mean, this was new. This was otherworldly. The disciples had never experienced something quite like this. Jesus had a, made a habit out of healing the sick and casting out demons. He'd even raised somebody from the dead at this point. But now Jesus was controlling the weather with his very breath. And in one act, Jesus showed the disciples that he was the creator of life, he was the sustainer of life, and he is the Lord of creation. And he showed them that he is more than capable of taking them through a storm and a lake and more than capable of taking them through the storms in their life. Remember I said people generally react to the storms of life in one of three ways, with worry, with anxiety, or number three is with faith. We've already talked about anxiety and worry. When Jesus' disciples came to him with their fear, he took care of the problem. Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. And then look what happens in verse 25. Then Jesus asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other. When he gives the command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Don't miss what might be the most important part of today's message. What might be the most important part of this story? The question that Jesus asked. Where is your faith? Where's your faith? I mean, disciples, come on. This guy's raised people from the dead. Friends, I believe Jesus asks us that same question today. Where's your faith today on July 30th, 2023, as you sit at Wooddale Church? You know, we, we sing these beautiful songs, and we sung some earlier today with Dave and the choir that we believe to be true about God. And we can even raise our hands in worship. We can sing those songs by heart. But practically, when the rubber meets the road, when we're in the public square, when we're in the arena of the neighborhood, the workplace, our home, what would people say that we believe? Would they even know that Jesus was important to us on Sunday morning? Where's your faith today? How's it living itself out? Listen, faith is a decision to put our trust and the only one who can ultimately handle any threats or danger that we may experience in this life. The disciples were powerless against that storm, not Jesus. Jesus is the first and the best place that we can go with our anxiety and our fear. The disciples and all the other people on the lake, remember Mark's gospel says other boats were with them. So there were others who experienced this miracle that day. All of those people saw an immediate response from the Lord of creation. Who is this man when he gives the command? Even the wind and the waves obey him. No one else can do that. So let me ask you again, where's your faith? Intellectually, you might be really good at the Sunday school answer. Where's your faith? And you can almost by rote and muscle memory say, Jesus is where my faith is, right? That's what I was supposed to say in Sunday school when I was growing up. Where's your faith? Jesus, that's the church answer. But is it really? Is he really the source of your strength and the source of your hope? Is he the one that you go to with your faith when the rubber meets the road? Or do you find yourself spiraling out of control in a web of worry when things don't go as planned? Are you anxious, as Jesus said to Martha, about many things? Let's talk about when the world was in the throes of COVID. Where was your faith then? As COVID began to disperse and people began to gather again, as a church, Wooddale asked, what can we do in this next season to point people to the only hope that matters? What can we do to help people understand that Jesus Christ is the hope for every generation? How can we equip a spiritually resilient generation? How can we reach the 30,000 households that are near our campuses with the hope of the gospel? We were hearing about long waits to get into counselors. We listened as people described the state of their marriage, many of them saying, my soon-to-be ex-wife or my soon-to-be ex-husband. 
Others talked about the burden of their finances or the grief they were experiencing, and still others talked about their need to find freedom from hurts and habits and hang-ups. Out of these longings and the Legacy of Hope campaign came something that we call the Family Resource Initiative, something that for a little less than a year now, it's been my privilege to help lead here at Wooddale. Today, when you walked into church, you received a brochure that looked like this, and it talks about help, hope, and healing, the support you need to connect you to a brighter future. Our, our hope with these brochures that you picked up today is that these don't just become something that you recycle on your way out of church, but that they become something that you use to share with people in your life who need hope. You see, we recognize that life isn't perfect. Sometimes the storms of life rage. Other times there are people in your life and it's maybe you who are just trying to figure things out. Whether you're hurting or you need help to navigate life circumstances, one of the things this brochure talks about is that the Family Resource Initiative is here to support you and you're gonna find people and you're gonna find tools to help you keep moving forward. And every day we're experiencing that. Pastor Dan is right now on the front row here and he, he partners with me in this ministry with our care department and that office. And we affectionately call our, our office right now the hospital of Wooddale Church because it's where people can come when they're hurting and they need to find hope. And every day the hospital is busy. One of the stories that comes out of this past year is we started a ministry called Reengage. And if you look further in your brochure, there's a little brochure about Reengage that's tucked inside here. It's a ministry for all marriages, whether your marriage is really, really good and you just want it to get better, or your ministries, your marriage is on life support. Reengage is a ministry that we've started to come alongside of couples and the pain and the hurt or the desire for a better marriage they're having. One couple that signed up for Reengage this year, there were a lot that were not from Wooddale. This year, we already have more people signed up for Reengage that are not from Wooddale than we had all of last year, which is really encouraging. Uh, we have room for more than we had last year. We have to move the location because it's become such a popular program. But one of the couples that signed up for that last year was not part of a church. And they told me near the end of the program, they said, Brian, you don't understand, like when we started Reengage, we started so that we could divorce amicably. We thought by the time this program was over, we were going to be divorced, but at least our kids would have a mom and dad who could get along. And today, they are closer than they've ever been as a couple because they began to focus not just on the things that every marriage needs to focus on, but the God of marriage. And they began to find relationship and hope that comes from Jesus Christ. We started these innovative things called Lunch and Learns every Thursday, and you see them in your programs often. And those lunch and learns really aren't designed for Wooddale Church. We want people from Wooddale coming, but what we've done is we've designed a program that talks about things like mental health and parenting and marriage and finances and grief and other topics. We've started these so that you have a super simple way to invite somebody who's not from Wooddale to come and spend a lunch break with us and maybe just get some nuggets. We're not gonna preach it, and we're gonna talk about the topic of the day but we're gonna give people some topics that can provide hope. And friends, already we're seeing people who've been invited to a lunch and learn, who've never attended a sermon here at Wooddale Church, who are part now of Celebrate Recovery, Grief Share, other ministries that we offer here at Wooddale to try to offer hope for others. And there's so much more that's happening in the Family Resource Initiative. You can find out more in this brochure, or you can go to our website, familyresource.info, where you can get a full schedule of what's happening. We've booked our Lunch and Learns through May of next year. They happen every Thursday, and God is doing some tremendous things. So let me, let me help you make today personal, though. If you're here today, and the state of your life is one of continued anxiety and worry and fear, number one, I wanna encourage you to identify your fears. And I want you to ask that question, am I dealing with anxiety today? Or am I dealing with worry today? Might be a great time to you know, take a, a notebook out and on, on one end you could put like perceived fears and then you could you know, on the other put, put the actual fears and begin to ask yourself, am I dealing with things that are perceived or is this a real threat? Because there's different ways that we're gonna handle that. Those of you who are anxiety sufferers, some of the best things that we can do when we have anxiety are actually go see a counselor and to go talk with somebody about the anxiety that has us spiraling right now. That is not a sign of weakness. The Bible says there's wisdom and a multitude of counselors, and that's one of the things that we offer downstairs. We'd love to help refer you to someone that can help you get the hope and the healing, and while you're waiting to get in, we'd love to be people that can walk alongside of you while the wait to get into that counselor happens. 
Because sometimes we just need to talk with somebody about those perceived fears and those actual fears, let's give them to Jesus too. And I would tell you, take that journal then and open it up like this and just pray, God, here it is. Here's what I'm struggling with. Some of it's real, some of it's perceived. Maybe I've got them in the wrong columns, but you know where they belong, God. And ultimately, I wanna cast these anxieties upon you because you care for me, you do. And I can trust you in this. And I can walk with people who will love me. Secondly, I wanna encourage you, bring your fears to Jesus. So do just that. The disciples did that right. Every week we have a connection card. Pastor Kyle spoke about it eloquently today as he shared about filling that out for his family already. And he said one of the things you could do there is put your prayer request down. Listen, we're a praying church. We take that seriously. Fill that out every week. What if, what if that became not like a chore that we do every week, but it became, this is like the clarion call so that we as a church can begin to develop spiritual calluses on our knees because we're a people who go to the only one who can do anything about the storms in our life. And if we did begin to develop calluses because we just can't stop sharing how we need prayer, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing for us to be. Third, I want to encourage you to replace your anxiety and fear with faith in the promises of God. You want a fun exercise to do today? Go to Google. It is good for some stuff. And you can say, Google, show me the promises of God in the Bible. And you'll get thousands upon thousands of websites that are full of the promises of God. I sat with a young woman this week in my office who's struggling with anxiety and I encouraged her to just take a look at who she is in Christ and, and begin that search. And every day now, she's listening as she does her devotions to the promises of God from Scripture about who she is. Who does God say that I am? And I want to give you a promise from God as we get ready to close things up today. And it's from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And it's interesting. It starts with the words, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. Because I think many of us in western suburbs struggle with loving money. Let's be honest. Money can sometimes be what we put our faith in. But then it continues, for God has said, I'll never fail you. I'll never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people or storms do to me? See, that's our God. That's the promise he has for you. Friends, God loves you and so do we. Wooddale Church exists to honor God by making more disciples for Jesus Christ. That's an amazing mission. And when we experience the peace and the hope and the joy that comes from following Christ, even in the storm, well, we should want others to experience that too. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that in the rough waters that we face in life, that you are there. It's not a storm that has ever come upon us that, has been a surprise to you. Lord, you weren't surprised in the first century when the disciples woke you up as you slept in that cushion. And God, because you don't sleep today, you're not surprised either. Father, help us to remember that storms in life that we all have from time to time are some of those crucible moments in our life that form us and forge the character that you are seeking to develop in us. So would you replace our fear, our worry, our anxiety with your faith? God, would you help us to be a lighthouse, a beacon to the world around us of how to respond when the storms of life come? Father, thank you that as a church, Wooddale was willing to say, hey, we'll step up as people are freaking out in culture around us to continue to be a church that points people to the light of the world. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your patience. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, it's been great to worship with you this week. As you go this week, I wanna encourage you again, take this with you, pray about, God, who, who in my life needs the hope that comes from you? And you should have a whole list of people like that. Pray, God, who can I share this with? And then I wanna, I wanna leave you with this benediction. Jesus to his disciples in the first century said, that I'm the light of the world, speaking about him. But then he said, oh, my disciples, my friends, you are the light of the world as well. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So Wooddale Church this week, may you live as a city on a hill 
that reflects the glorious character of the Lord that we serve, the Lord of creation. And may the faith that you have in him be something that resonates with all those around you. God bless you. Have a great week.